de la Gozelis. A Cupra Bela de Magosala, Dinama Goshala, the Holy Spirit, we thank you. We give you the glory and we give you the praise. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for your wisdom that directs our lives. Thank you for the light that govern. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit that makes us alive and unites us in the commonwealth of the inheritance of the saints in Christ Jesus. Lord, we are grateful. Thank you for what you are set to do in this season. Thank you for a new generation of watchmen and guardians. The men in whom you are the spirit of excellence, the spirit of God. To establish the righteousness and the justice of God upon the earth and to do your will. Thank you for counting us worthy. Thank you because your word is powerful enough to change lives and to bring the influence of your government upon your people that we may see beautiful days, heavens on earth, heaven on earth. We love you, Lord. And we are sat to glean at your feet tonight. Feed us, O oh Lord. Give us today our daily bread. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' most powerful name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. I am so excited to be speaking to you tonight again on this Holy Spirit inspired broadcast. Um, Apostle Victor again is my name. And of course, this is Life Spring Assembly right here in the city of London. Um, and I've got something exciting to share with you tonight. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone who joined the Holy Ghost Summit that we had um, last weekend. It was a life transforming experience for all of us, um, with, for myself and for everyone over here. And I, I hope it's been life changing and life transforming for you too, wherever you have been watching us from all over the world. Um, and I pray that God bless you real good in Jesus' name. And perhaps you're looking at me today and you haven't um, heard what the Holy Spirit had to say to us over last weekend. Please go back and watch um, and catch up. Um, and, and rewatch the, the the word for for um, Friday the fourteenth, um, Saturday the fifteenth, and Sunday the sixteenth of August. Tonight I've got something very very important to share with you. Um, the Lord ladies on my heart. So the title of tonight's service is called uh, Being Spiritual. Okay, Being Spiritual. And of course, uh, we've laid a very good foundation over last weekend. Um, about the, the person of the Holy Spirit, the works of the Holy Spirit, and how to be led by the Holy Spirit. So tonight we're going to look at a life of a spiritual person. Okay, so when you hear, oh, sp uh, being spiritual or, or living a spiritual life and, and walking, and taking a spiritual walk with God, what does it mean to be spiritual? And, and how can you be spiritual? So perhaps if you're not spiritual and you want to live a spiritual life, you want to... Um, you want to be you want to live a supernatural life okay so i'm going to be telling you tonight what it means to be spiritual and how to intentionally engage in a spirit supernatural life and of course you do know that this is partaking of god's nature because the bible says god is spirit okay and those that must worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth okay it means those that will worship god must be those who have the same nature as god okay those who are also spirit as god is spirit and in your tripartite nature, meaning you are made up of three personalities, you have the spirit, um, you've got a soul, and you live in the body. Okay, so in, in your tripartite nature, there is a portion of you that is spirit. Okay, and so we want to look at how to engage your spirituality tonight, which is a life that we've been called to live. It is a spirit life. Um, so my primary text tonight will be taken from Romans chapter 8. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a couple of scriptures tonight. Okay, I'm gonna try to make it short and sharp, um, and I'm gonna read a couple of scriptures tonight. So let's start. Let's start from Romans chapter eight. Um, this was a scripture that I read a lot um, during the conference. So I'm gonna read Romans chapter eight. I'm gonna read from verse five to verse seventeen. So if you have your Bibles, please uh, pick it. Um, get your pens and your pads and take notes. Okay. So again, we're talking about being spiritual. Okay, we're talking about how to engage your, how to engage God, who is spirit, with your, 
with the department or the faculty that he created in you, spirit. And the reason why he made that part of you, spirit, so that he can relate with you because he is spirit. So, in order to, so what we're talking about tonight is how to consciously, spiritually engage God who is spirit, okay, in order to live a spiritual or a supernatural life. Okay, so Romans chapter 8. Gonna read, start reading from verse 5. So just follow me with your heart. I would read through this time, okay? And then I would speak to you um, about what we're talking about. Okay, so Romans chapter 8 from verse 5, it says, Those who are dominated, underline that word if you're following me, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. Okay? I'll start again. Those who are dominated by sinful nature, by the sinful nature, think about sinful things. But those who are controlled, so the word dominated um, also can be substituted by controlled. Okay, so if something has dominion over you, that means it is, it is the controlling influence over you. Okay, but those who are controlled by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, Think about things that please the spirit. So the things that I want you to begin to compare and contrast now, um, and compare and contrast certain words that stand out. Okay, those. Okay, this means there are certain people. Okay, it means not everyone. Okay, there are certain people. Those, this certain subset of people who are dominated. Okay, under the influence and the control of. Dominated by the sinful nature. Okay, so the sinful nature is a monarch. Okay, it has power, it has controlling power, and it can dominate. That's what the scripture means. Okay, those who are dominated by who? Because the next thing you want to know is who, who, those who are dominated by what? By who? By the sinful nature. What, what are their traits and characteristics? How would you know? They think about sinful things. But, so on the contrary now, those who are controlled, also dominated by who? The Holy Spirit. They do what? What are the traits and characteristics? How do you identify them? They also think. So, other than the word think, they think about things that please the Spirit. So now we know that there are certain people, or there are two kinds of people in this world. Okay, and these two kinds of people are dominated by something. Okay, there is no one that is free from a dominating influence. Everyone, either on this side of the divide or on that side of the divide, everybody are, uh, they, everybody is under the influence of something that, that is so compelling and has control over you. Okay, pay attention to me tonight. And there are two sides of the divide. There are those who are dominated by the sinful nature. And the way you know them is that they think about sinful things. And those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, and this is how you know them, they think about things that please the Spirit. Let's go further now. So, let, so letting your sinful nature control your mind. Okay, so what is the handle? Of this dominating power what is the handle what is the steering wheel that this dominating influence puts its hands on and begins to control okay so if you're if you see um, the reason why someone driving a car um, when if they get into an accident the car doesn't get arrested the car doesn't go to court the car doesn't face the wrath of justice it is the person driving the car why because the car cannot drive itself Okay, someone is driving the car. Okay, so in, in the case of um, transport crime or motor, um, 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 a motorway crime, and it is the person who sits behind the wheel that gets arrested and that gets prosecuted for a road transport crime. So if there were three people in a, in a, in a car, okay, and, and in fact, if someone is not wearing the seatbelt, when the police pull, pulls the vehicle over, the driver will be liable, okay, if the person is under a certain age. Because the driver is considered responsible for everything that goes on in the car that he has control over, okay. So whoever sits on that driver's seat is the one that is liable. And that is why the person sitting on the passenger seat doesn't need an insurance. 
The person sitting at the back seat doesn't need an insurance. But you see, the driver of the vehicle must be insured because should in case any accident or any thing happens, the driver is the one that will be responsible. Why? He is considered to be the one who has control and influence over the vehicle and everything inside the vehicle and anything that the vehicle can affect externally. So the same way, if the sinful nature is as a controlling influence, there must be a handle, okay? So there must be a pedal and a, and, and, and a gear and a, and, and, and a steering and a, and a, and a gear lever, lever by which the person who has the dominating influence interfaces with the car and controls the, 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 the attitude, the character, and, 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 and the controls the car. Okay, so the, the way the sinful nature controls those, okay, those are means people, okay, those who are means certain people are dominated by the sinful nature, which is the influence, the force that has that can grab and handle and force a control or instigate a control, okay, and the handle by which this force influences and takes charge and seek to control or control these people that he has influence over the handle is called the mind okay so romans chapter 8 verse 6 says so letting your sinful nature which is the controlling influence control your mind but angus leads to death Okay, if you followed my teaching um, throughout last week, I, I, I spoke about a road. I spoke about a journey. Okay, I spoke about a road. I spoke about the, the one who leads in this road and I spoke about a destination. Please go catch up on those, on those tapes and it will do you a whole lot of good. Okay, so the sinful nature controls your mind. If you let, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life. Okay, so on the line the word leads. Okay, on the start on the line the two destinations to death and to life. Okay, and then on the line the fact that the control the control handle is the mind. Okay, this is how to read your Bible, the mind. Okay, so let's continue now. Verse seven says, why why does the sinful nature lead to death or lead to death? Verse 7 answers that. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law and it never will. Verse 8. And that's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. I'll keep reading. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. Sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living in you. Okay? You are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. Keep reading verse 10 now. It says, and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Verse 11, it gets more beautiful now. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Gets more beautiful now. Verse 12 says, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation. Underline that again. You have no obligation. No, and the, the Bible used the word no obligation here. It, it, it didn't say you are not under compulsion. It didn't say you are not under force. It says you have no obligation. The reason is because it, it highlighted that you do not have the nature. Because Apostle Paul here was writing to a church, okay? He was writing to a church of believers. And this church was in Rome. Hence, this letter is called Romans, okay? It is a letter, it's an epistle, okay? A letter written by an apostle to a church which was in Rome, okay? And he said he was speaking to them, telling them, reminding them of their new state. 
haven't submitted their life to Christ and having the Spirit of Christ in them and haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, he was in reminding them what that meant or what that means because I'm speaking to you today and these words are still relevant to you today. He says, you are no longer under, you have no obligation. And the reason why he used the word no obligation is because if you don't have the Spirit of God, you do not belong to God. And hence, you are perpetually, continuously, permanently under the influence of the sinful nature. You don't even have a plan B. Do you understand? You could, you could never, you could never do anything else. You are continuously, perpetually under the influence of the cravings of your flesh and your soul. You are governed by your five senses. You are governed. In other words, you eat because your belly says it's time to eat. But you see, for us who are under the influence of the spirit, we have the ability to tell our belly who is in charge. So I, I can tell my belly, I eat when I want to eat, not because you tell me to eat. So for those of us who have the spirit of God, we have, we have subscribed to a different influence. And because of our subscription to that different influence, even though this influence does not seek to make us slave by being a tyrant or a dictator, it seeks to make us slave by being so inspiring that we buy into the inspiration that comes from the Holy Spirit. So we begin to follow Him willingly and we follow Him so, we follow him so submissively that we look like slaves but we are not captives under a dictator but we submitted ourselves willingly as a response to the understanding of what Christ did for us and so Apostle Paul said if you live your life like this your refusal to be governed by the influence of your flesh it is it is it is an obligation in other words you could have the Holy Spirit and you could still choose to submit to the influence that comes from your flesh do you understand that? In other words, you can be born again and you can still keep unbelieving friends who would invite you to a party and you know what's going to happen in the party and you, so you are not, whereas when you were in the world, when you wasn't born again, you, 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 you couldn't even, you couldn't even decide otherwise. You just go because that is the only thing that makes sense, right? When you were, if you're without Christ, the only thing that makes sense is just enjoy, have fun, and just, just live your life and enjoy yourself, okay? Just have reckless fun. But when you meet Christ now and you accept him as your Lord, as the owner of your life, you don't own your life. He, he owns the life that you now live. And because of that, you live as though you are a slave to him because you live his life that he has handed over to you at his dictates that comes through his spirit. And so because of that, the Bible says um, we have no obligation to do what our sinful nature urges, urges us to do. And the reason is because we now, by the consciousness of the Spirit, have um, accountability to Christ, whose life we now live. So it says, dear brothers and sisters, Romans chapter 8 verse 12, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You see it says it here. The sinful nature has no ability to command you anymore when you are subscribed to the government of God. But as long as you are still in the world, as long as you are still outside the influence of God's kingdom, the, the sinful nature doesn't urge you. It commands you. And you can't even refuse the command. The sinful nature commands you to slave yourself to get money. And you can't refuse it because money has been painted to you to be the most important commodity as far as this existence is concerned. So in all thy getting, according to scripture, is get wisdom. But in the, in the constitution of the world, in all thy getting, get money. And because of that, money... Okay, I don't want to go ahead of myself. So, we are no longer under obligation to do what our sinful nature urges us to do. Verse 13, if you live by its dictates, you will die, okay? So, and this is again, this may sound a bit controversial to those who think once you got, once you got saved, that's it. You're going to heaven. It, they cannot, this is, there's only a flip. It can't flop. The Bible class tells you here, it is still a flip flop. Do you understand that? If you live by the dictates of, because your 
the flesh will still try to dictate to you. Your soul will still try to dictate to you. And that is where we encounter what we call temptation. It will still try to dictate to you. And the Bible says, if you live by its dictates, you will die. You will die. In other words, it doesn't matter how many times or how much you think your own giving your life to Christ is more intense than everybody else. If you live by the dictates, in other words, when your flesh begins to dictate certain things to you, if you live simply means it becomes a way of life. If you take it as a way of life again to begin to follow the dictates of your flesh, you will die. Because remember, the sinful nature is a controlling influence, influence and all those who accept this influence, this influence leads them to a destination. And that destination is called death. But if you, through the power of the Spirit, if you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. And what are the deeds of the sinful nature? Galatians. Galatians chapter 4. If you read Galatians chapter 4, um, or Galatians chapter 5. Let me show you. Let me show you. Let me show you Galatians chapter 5. And then you begin to understand. You begin to understand more of these things. Okay. Galatians chapter 5. From verse 18, it says, But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation to the law of Moses. Okay? So you see, once you come under the influence of the Spirit, everything else becomes an obligation. In other words, the influences outside you does not have the power to compel you anymore. It is an obligation. So you can only choose to, but you have the power to choose now. When you're under the influence of the Spirit of God. Verse 19 says, in Galatians chapter 5. Verse 19, it says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Okay? These are the fruits that your life will bear. I mean, we will see these things. So, so if you want to know a man who is under the, the influence of sinful nature, remember Romans chapter 8, okay, from verse 5, it speaks about two influences, the sinful nature and the Holy Spirit. Now, Galatians chapter 5 from verse 19 helps us to identify and helps you to put your life under check to know which influence you are under. And it will help you to filter through the society that you're living in as well. To know the influence that is predominantly governing the lives of the people around you. Predominantly governing the lives of the people of your same age range in your generation. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. And these are the results now. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures. Verse 20 says, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambitions, dissension, division, envy, drunk drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. So these are just few. But think about all the terrible things that take root but these things that i mentioned to you they are they are good enough to give you an idea so you know that's what i says it is very clear the result of being influenced because that influence governs your life along a certain path that and that path already has a character and attributes that are attributed to that road if you walk that road your life immediately begins to show certain things that by the by those things we can judge what influence you are under but let me show you those who are under the influence of the Spirit of God. Their life also shows certain traits that helps us to know. And they are clear. It shows the influence that they are under. But let me finish reading that, um, the works of the flesh. It says, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? Will not inherit the kingdom of God. God is a king. And as a king, he has an empire. And he wants his children to inherit his empire. And to that end, he, he, he came into the world and he saved us. And he adopted us into his family. To the end that we may enjoy and reign in his kingdom. And partake of his kingdom and inherit his kingdom. But the Bible says that if you accept, after accepting Jesus, 
as the new governing authority over your, over your life, if you go subscribe again to the influence of the sinful nature, these traits will be the fruits that your life begins to bear. And if you bear this fruit, and if you live this kind of way, you could never experience the end for which God came to save you. You will never inherit his kingdom. Verse 26 says, but those, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. In other words, if you subscribe to the influence of the Spirit of God, these will be the traits that your life will begin to show. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against these things. In other words, if your life, if you begin to live a life that is conducive to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit begins to bear, because listen, verse 22 says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in you. So it is the job, one of the, remember when I was teaching about the Holy Spirit, one of the works of the Holy Spirit is He bears fruit in us. Okay? So when your spirit becomes conducive for the Holy Spirit to live in you, He begins to bear fruit. So when your life lacks fruit, begin to know that your life is hostile to the Holy Spirit. Because the way you know that your life is conducive for the Holy Spirit to live in is it, it, it begins to bear fruit. It, it, it is a fruit producer. And the fruits that it produces are the things that I just read to you now. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the immediate results that you begin to see in your life. And this makes you know that your life has now aligned with the government of God that is administered by His Spirit. And against these things, there is no law. Now, so let's jump back to Romans, where we were reading. It says, if you, if you live by the dictates of your sinful nature, which we now know the fruits, we now know the traits, we now know how to identify where the sinful nature is in operation. If you live by your sinful nature, by the dictates of your sinful nature, you will die. Okay? But if you, through the power of the Spirit, allow the Spirit to bear fruit in you, and by that fruit, you, because the Bible says, if you, by the power of the Spirit, if you put to death the deed of the flesh, what this means is, through the fruits that will be produced by the Holy Spirit in you, you can destroy the fruits that sinful nature has produced in you. So whereas you used to spend your time watching pornography, now you now spend your time watching preaching like you're doing today. Whereas you used to spend your time hanging out with friends in parties, drinking and, and doing, indulging yourself in all manner of things, now you spend your time living for God, helping people and, 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 and being an inspiration that, that brings people ever closer to God. Whereas you used to be so angry and you just burst out in anger, now you live a life of peace and you help people experience peace. Whereas before you used to be so moody and sorrowful and depressed and, and spread that same virus around, now you live a life full of joy and your joy is so contagious that when people come around you, they just become joyful. If you through the power of the Spirit of God put to death the deeds of the flesh, in other words, discontinue the traits that has been born in you as a fruit because you were under the influence of the sinful nature, if you by the power of the Spirit of God, allowing the Spirit to bear new fruits in you, and this fruit begins to replace the works of the flesh. The fruit of the Spirit begins to replace the work of the flesh. And this is how we know that you are under the government and the influence of the kingdom of God that is administered by His Spirit. For all those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. Remember, and God needs His children to reign with Him and to inherit His kingdom for He is a king. And God is king over all creation and beyond. Okay? The kingdom and the government of the heavens, He mounts that by Himself. But you see, the government over the realms of the earth, He has given, He has outsourced and dedicated that dominion to the, to the to mankind 
and the intention of God is that through his governing influence, he will influence man so that man will know how to conduct himself in the earth by which he will maintain dominion. And this dominion will be under the dominion of God because man submits to the authority of God. But there is another influence out there. And I make bold to tell you, this influence governs most people. Most of the people on earth are governed by the influence of the sinful nature. And that is why if you look around you in the society, the things that I read to you as the works of the flesh, these are the things that you see everywhere. And it's indicative of the fact that people are under an influence and that influence is called the sinful nature. So now, let me read a little bit from my notes. And I will show you some more scriptures. So what I've decided to be doing now is when I'm teaching you, I would show you scriptures, okay, that speaks about the mind of God. And also I will show you scriptures where the, the scripture that I've shown you or that, so say for example, I'm teaching about a topic called being spiritual, okay. I will give you scriptures like Romans chapter 8, okay, that tells you about being spiritual. And I will also give you scriptures like um, Galatians chapter 5 from verse um, 19, all of all the way to 23 that speaks to you about the evidence the the things that the, the life applicable things that makes you understand scripture then i will through scripture give you scenarios again okay the holy spirit begins to speak to me this way that i should begin to teach this way so that the word of god will not just be vague to you okay i will give you an inspiration i will show you a revelation and i will also show you how it affects your daily lives and or how you can begin to check yourself against the word of God and this is how you can come under the influence of this word okay so I'm going to read some things that are written down when the Holy Spirit was speaking to me about this topic and I make notes when the Holy Spirit speaks to me so I'm going to read that note to you and I'll show you a couple of more scriptures then I'll pray for you okay it says on here I, 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 I put like a, a quote in quote being spiritual being God conscious a mind set up to take dominion okay now follow me now. I wrote down here, I says, being spiritual is partaking of God's divine nature because God is spirit and his character and ways are spiritual. And he, what he does can only be understood by those who share his nature. In other words, in order to understand God's spiritual ways and God's spiritual strategies and God's spiritual manner of doing what it does you must be spiritual because if you're not spiritual you cannot comprehend him the Bible says spiritual things are only spiritually designed and they are foolishness to the carnal mind carnal mind simply means unspiritual mind and remember I told you when I was reading Romans chapter 8 to you that the handle of this influence is both on the two sides of the divine either the Holy Spirit or the sinful nature the handle is the mind so pay attention and that is why I subtitled this being spiritual as a mind set to take dominion. Okay? A mind set to take dominion. A mind that is governed by the influence of the Spirit of God, that mind is set to take dominion. A mind that is governed by the influence of the sinful nature, that mind is set to take defeat at all times. And that defeat leads to death. But the dominion that is taken by a, by a mind that is governed by the influence of the Spirit of God, this dominion leads to life. So I wrote down in my note here as well, I said we were created spirits, okay? So when Genesis chapter 1, when God created man, when God called the Godhead to a meeting and he introduced an agenda that he had, he said in Genesis chapter 1, 26, he says, let us make man in our image, spirit, and in our likeness to have our character. And it says, and let him have dominion so the, the end to which we are going to create man and the end to which we selected the peculiar material that went into the creation of man is that the man may have a certain stature that is able to fulfill an assignment and this assignment is having dominion so we were created spirit why so that god can relate with us because god can only relate with spirit Okay, so in our form, in our creation, because there is a for, for the, the 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 making of man. Let me use that word. The making of man is constitutes the creation by the spirit, the formation by the flesh, and the making by the consciousness of the soul. The creation by the spirit, the forming by the flesh and the making 
by the consciousness of the soul. Okay? So, I said we were made spirit, we were created spirit, formed as physical flesh, and made conscious by our soul. And that forms, the soul then forms the intelligence that directs our decisions. It is the will of God that the faculty of man that controls him and his affairs be influenced by the spirit that lives on the inside of our spirit. And this spirit is supposed to be the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says the whole world is under the sway of the devil. Under the, the spirit that is at work in the children of disobedience, the prince of the power of the air, the Bible calls it. It says the, the, the whole world is under the influence of the prince of the power of the air, which is the devil. The spirit now at work in the children of disobedience. So most people who are governed by their sinful nature, they are under, Malibra Andos, the influence of the prince of the power of the air. And that is why in the generation that you're living in, the, the, the most potent and the most powerful influence that governs the life of people are controlled from the air, from social media, from the news. These are controlling influences that take advantage of airwaves. And the one behind the steering wheel is the devil. The one who invented the sinful nature. The father of sin. It is the will of God that we be the faculty of man that controls him. And this faculty is the soul. Okay? But the intention of God is that man's soul be influenced by his spirit. Why? Because the spirit of God indwells the spirit of man. And so the policy direction, the government of God is, 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 is put upon our spirit or installed into our spirit. The policy direction, the government, the influence, the constitution of the kingdom of God is installed in our spirit by the Holy Spirit and, and by the influence that comes from our spirit, our soul is supposed to receive instruction by which it directs our flesh. That is a man who is fully under the influence and the control of God. A man that is controlled by the Holy Spirit journeying towards life. But a man who is under the influence of the sinful nature, the reverse, the reverse is the case. In the life that we're living in today, many are governed by mammon. The deity of gold, the deity of money. Many are governed by, by mammon, money. And this influence comes in all forms. But it is from the same idol, mammon. And you know what idols are? Idols are only point of contact for deities, okay? Idols. So you can see an idol, you can see a wood carved out. So for example, let's say this, this is not an idol, by the way, okay? This is just a piece of furniture. But let's say I decide to make this an idol now, okay? So, and I decide to name it. Say I name it idol A, okay? So this, for this to be an idol, there must be a spirit that this represents. You understand that? So for this thing to be an idol, it must represent a spirit. And so because that spirit is invisible, and because I am a physical person, and I cannot deal with an invisible spirit, I need a point of contact. I need something physical by which I interface with that invisible spirit. So every time I see this thing, I accord unto it the respect that I want to accord to the spirit that I want to relate with. Okay? But like I said, this thing is just furniture. Doesn't represent anything. Okay, so the idols of the nations, the Bible says in the book of Psalms 135, verse 15, the idols of the nations are gold and silver, the works of the hands of men. And also in Psalm 115, verse 4, it says the same thing the idols of the world, the idols of the nations, gold and silver, and the works of the hands of men. And look around you today. The governing, the predominant governing influence over people is gold and silver, is money. 
and the greed, the, the, the desire of men to attain greatness by their own this, by their own ways, by their own workings, to achieve greatness and to put their name on it so that men can bow to them, the works of the hands of men. And that is why Jesus would say in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, and he would say, no man can serve two masters. And Jesus didn't go ahead to, to talk about different many masters. He just narrowed it down to two. God and mammon. In other words, in Romans chapter 8 verse 5, reading down, it only introduces us to two influences. There are no three influences, two. It is only the Holy Spirit or the sinful nature. And this sinful nature, are, they are, it is a nature, isn't it? And spirits have nature. So the sinful nature is a nature of a spirit. Okay? The prince of the power of the air that is in a, in, in, at work in the children of disobedience. And the, 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 the idol, Malibra Andos, that represents this spirit is called money. And the nature of this spirit is called sinful nature. And the traits of this nature are in, uh, in Galatians chapter 5 from verse 19 that I read to you. But you see, the one behind these masks, these layers of masks, is the devil. And also, the, 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 the nature of God, the custodian, the one who teaches that nature, is the Holy Spirit. Because God is a spirit and God is holy. And his spirit is the Holy Spirit. And the holiness is the nature of God. And when the spirit lives in you, there are traits that begins to follow your life. And it is joy and peace and long suffering and kindness and gentleness and all faithfulness and all of these things that I read to you in Galatians chapter, uh, chapter 5 from verse 22. And so the one behind all these layers of purity is God. The one behind all these layers of impurity is the devil. And so that you will not live your life in ambiguity, I'm not really being sure of what's going on. And that is why I'm bringing light to you today. So let me read for a little bit. What we see, Malibra Andos, the nations of the idols are gold and silver. Okay? So what the what he wants us to see is him. Okay, so I began to, um, I think here, I'm going to give you a scripture. Okay? And then I'm going to come back to my notes so that you understand because as I'm reading it, I understand what I've written but I want you to understand it because I didn't write it for myself. I wrote it for you. Or I wrote it so that I will be able to communicate it to you and of course to keep the knowledge of God. I would say we are supposed to preserve knowledge. Okay? So this is for preservation of knowledge and of course to share with you. So let me give you a life application example of what it means to be under the influence of the kingdom of God. Now, like I said to you, God is a spirit. Okay, and his nature is a spiritual nature, and by nature, you know that there is nothing too hard for God to do, there is nothing that is impossible to God. And so, one of the reasons why people don't like Christianity or people are not really, really passionate about Christianity is because people talk about so much possibilities, but we don't see these things happen, so it begins to look like a joke. So, I feel like you know, I would rather just do the crazy things that bears immediate results. That this thing that people claim best result, but hey, we're just hanging around 10, 15 years now and we're not seeing any results. Okay? Now, we understand supernatural and spiritual as possibilities that are out of this world. And somehow, in everybody, there is this desire to have this superhero effect. But we don't know how to. Now, that is what I want to show you tonight. It is partaking, it is called partaking of God's nature, it is called being spiritual. There are possibilities that are only limited and are only isolated and reserved for the spiritual people. You don't see men flying, taking off and just flying in the air. If you see that, you only see that in the movies, isn't it? You only see that in superhero movies. In other words, there are certain possibilities, certain, certain um, expressions that are not captured within the scope of, of what natural men can do. So that when you see those things, instantly your brain just interprets it as supernatural or superpowers or anything but super. Or super. So I want to show you how to live a super life. How to live a super natural life. How super gets added to your natural and it, it, it alters your possibilities forever. And then you will fall in love with God. Because he is a God who is so 
who walks, his ways are supernatural. His ways, his strategies of dealing with all those who reside in this realm is a supernatural way. Okay? So let me show you Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to show you something today. And this will, this will bless you. Matthew chapter 14. And the subject, the case study today that we're considering is about a man so popular, his name is Peter. So if you've been reading your Bible or you're familiar with Bible, you, you know this guy. He's, he's one of the most popular, he's, he's the most popular disciple that Jesus had when he was alive. Because this guy was so outspoken, he just cannot keep his mouth shut. He will ask questions. Peter cannot keep quiet for long. He will challenge something that no one is saying anything about. Okay? And in this passage that I want to read to you is that character of his kicked in again. So well, let's see what happens. So, um, Matthew chapter 14 from verse 22. Okay? Follow me closely and you will be blessed. It says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. And while he sent the people home, after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Okay, gets more interesting now. Pay attention now. Verse 24 now says, Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble. Underline that now. The disciples were in, they were in trouble. Far away from land. Brahandos, they were in trouble far away. So God wanted to paint a picture to his disciples here. Jesus wanted to paint a picture to his disciples here. So he sent them into an experience that took them far away from the land. Because you see, land is a place where human beings live. So they know their ways around the land. Okay? But you see, now they were on the sea. And you see, on the sea, there are no handles. Okay? It is a place with no border. When you, when you journey out into the sea and now you are far away from the land. You are in... There is no... There is no... You are upon the waters now. There are no railings to hold on to you. There is a shaking. You are at the mercy of the receding of the wind. Do you understand that? So meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble. Because every single word, I noticed when I was reading this passage, every single word had a deep meaning. They were in trouble far away from the land. Remember, man was formed from the dust of the earth. Man was made. The substance by which man, the physical part of man was made, which all of you know. That's all you know about yourself. The physical, the fact that you're just physical. And so that means everything you do is physical. What governs you are physical things. That physical part of you was formed by the dust of the land. So you are a land man. If God doesn't live in you, and if you don't have the consciousness of God's divinity, if you have not been saved and have not become spirit conscious, you are just a land man. But what God wanted to teach them here, what Jesus wanted to teach them here, was possibilities that, that transcends the scope of what is captured only on land. So he sent them into the sea. And they, went, they entered into a trouble. But let's see what this trouble is. They were on, in trouble far away from the land. For a strong wind. Underline this now. A strong wind. Underline that. Had risen. And they were fighting heavy waves. Underline that too. So, we're, so the reason why they are in trouble is because they have encountered two strange influences. Or two strange manifestations of an influence. Okay? And this influence is called trouble. But the manifestation of this trouble right now is that there is a strong wind and a very heavy waves. Or very heavy waves. Strong wind and very heavy waves. Pay attention now. It was about three o'clock in the morning. And Jesus came toward them. Okay, so the lesson is about to start. I don't know, the lesson has started, but the explanation is about to start. So Jesus walked towards them. He came towards them walking on water. Now, walking on land is no big deal. Okay, because the land is solid and it supports everything that is on it. 
So walking on land makes perfect sense. It is perfectly consistent with the laws of nature. Okay? And so the man who was formed on land, lived all his life on land, comfortable with the land, because the land is in him, he is in the land, doesn't have a problem walking on the land. But you see, this man now, and for that man, and this man now is on the sea. And for this man to go on the sea, he had to plant a tree on the land. And from that tree, he had to fetch wood. And with that wood, he had to build a boat. Because he can only, my Libra Andos, the only way this man can keep afloat is by standing on land. Or whatever is land, whatever has land in it. Okay? So, for men to go on the sea, men would have to cut down trees and fashion woods from a tree and make for themselves a boat. And so they would put this boat on the surface of the water and they will, this boat will bear them. So they will enter into the boat and when they do that, they have the confidence to thrust out into the sea, being carried by land. Okay? So men could not approach the sea just by going to the sea. They, they needed to go with land because all they know is land. All they know is natural. And the water is, in, by nature, water is supernatural. It can take the shape of anything. You cannot take the shape of anything. You force everything into your shape. Isn't it? But you see, water can take the shape of anything. There is no limit to the possibilities of water. The water is called a universal solvent. It means it can dissolve anything. Water in England is water in Nigeria. Is water in the US. Is water in Latin America. Water is a universal universal solvent. Your solvent, and it can take the shape of everything. So, uh, but men do not know how to approach water except by the instrumentation and by the technology fashion on land. And Jesus wanted to prove a point. He wanted to teach them a very important lesson on supernatural nature or being spiritual. So maybe you read this story so many times if you've been Christian. I, I, I don't know how many times. This story, you know, stories like this are often preached about in church because they, they, comp they constitute good sermons for preachers and we clap our hands and we get aroused, you know, get massaged and we feel like, wow, church today was good and we had a powerful message. But you know, most of the time, or all the times that I've heard the scripture preach, I have never heard it taught like this, how the Holy Spirit taught me. Because I, it, the Holy Spirit did not use this to tell the typical stories that people tell, you know. Pay attention to me now. It says they were in big trouble. And this trouble came at them in the form of strong wind and heavy waves. And then all of a sudden, Jesus began to approach and Jesus began to do something that was Contrary to the convention on land, it defied the logics of the land. He began to walk on sea without anything, without land between him and the sea. In other words, he became one. Because you see, when a man walks on the earth, the man is almost like you become one with the earth because your feet, the land agrees with your feet. So it sustains you. And in order for Jesus to walk, on the surface of the water, it means the water agreed with his feet and the water decided to sustain him because it is um, agreeing with the laws, laws of nature is that if, if man comes on water, man will sink because, or anything that has weight, by the way, will sink because the surface tension of water cannot support the weight of a man. But you see, it is possible for man to float on water. You just need to understand. And that is why our life is so supernatural, but we don't understand. Isn't it so funny that even though men can drown in the ocean, if you toss a man into the, into the sea, he can drown. Yet, you can toss another man into the sea and they will float. Why? Because they have learned the ways of the water. <laughs> but the man who doesn't understand the ways of the water, if you toss him into the sea, he just goes down like a stone. So what goes down when you throw into the water is supposed to be a stone, right? A stone that cannot do anything, it just goes. So the man that you throw into the water and goes down is not, doesn't differ from a stone. In other words, that man is lifeless. But the ability to know the ways of the water and to be able to keep afloat, to become one with the water and to be able to negotiate your movement around the water is understanding the ways of the water. It is indicative of life. 
And we exhibit these things in our mundane life, but we still don't understand because the reason why God created nature is to explain spiritual things to us. But we lack understanding, so we cannot see God in mundane things. Yet, people expect to see God in supernatural, superficial, breaking down, massive, and God is not, most of them are not, God is not in those things. The world God created was designed to teach man, to aid man, to understand him. So Jesus was walking on the water. This was contrary to the convention on land, but this was the convention of the sea. It is possible. Jesus was trying to reveal to them a possibility that has not been captured in what they have known all their life long. So up until now, they have, it has never entered into their mind that it is possible for a man to walk on the sea. Probably they know about swimming. But you see, to walk is not captured in the possibilities that are bound in the realm that they were living in. And Jesus wanted to introduce them to new possibilities. So he walked up to them. So I hope you unlearn the word trouble. I hope you unlearn the word strong wind and heavy waves. Okay? And verse 26 now, pay attention. When the disciples saw him, understand, underline the word saw. Saw him. Actually, understand the two words. When the disciples saw him, Walking on the water, they were terrified. On the line, the word terrified. The natural reaction of man to something he captures as evil is fear. The natural reaction of man to something he captures as evil and something he feels he is vulnerable to is fear. So as soon as they saw Jesus, they thought he was a ghost. No, no, let, don't let me don't let me go ahead of myself. When they saw when they saw him walking on water, they were terrified. So the Bible showed, said why. They saw him walking on water and seeing him walking on water terrified them. And the Bible says, in their fear, they cried out, it is a ghost. So their interpretation of what they have just seen now. Look, it was God trying to teach them a lesson. And so God started his teaching aid. He brought them to a school of not writing on chalkboards and, 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 and presenting slides in front of them. He brought them to the school of, in, of encounter. Um, Libra and those. He brought them to a school where supernatural is displayed before their physical eyes. He brought them to an hands on school. He was revealing a truth to them. And remember, I said, truth are realities that are revealed by the Spirit of God. And when they saw this truth, they were terrified. And in their fear, they interpreted it as it is a ghost. In other words, walking on water, they admitted and they agreed that it is a possibility that is only available to a ghost. Do you understand that? So, seeing Jesus walk on water, to them, it was okay. But, the walking on water only to them, as far as they're concerned, only signifies the presence of something. And this something has to be a ghost. The only thing that has the ability to exhibit what we are seeing in front of our eyes is a ghost. In other words, and of course, ghosts are not humans. Ghosts are spirits. And they were men. So they say, look, whatever this thing is that is walking towards us by the, by the exhibition of what it's doing, which is walking on water, and by our knowledge of what can exhibit these traits and character, we come to a conclusion. We are seeing a ghost. And as far as they're concerned, ghosts are evil. And they come to arm you. And hence the reason why they're terrified. We are seeing a ghost. And this ghost is coming to do something terrible to us. Now verse 27, pay attention now. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid. You see, the first thing Jesus addressed was their mind. Because now, their mind was in a state now of being fearful because of what their eyes have seen. Remember, it says, when the disciples saw him, walking on the water, exhibiting the character of a ghost. 
exhibited the character of a spirit when the disciples saw him. And the eyes is a gateway into the soul. It is, it, is a, it is a platform by which the soul is fed. So when the disciples saw him carrying out an attribute of a spirit, they became terrified. So when Jesus came, he addressed their minds. He said, don't be afraid. He said, take courage. I am here. He didn't say to them, that was in the ghost. No, no, no. He just said, don't be afraid. In other words, change the state of your mind. Take courage. Why? Because I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it is really you, tell me to come to you. I told you Peter is the one that always comes up with these things. Tell me to come to you. On the line again now. Walking on the water. So Peter said something very, very strange here that I have never heard any preacher say to me. Peter, along with all the other disciples, identified they see something now. And this thing that they've seen, they've seen this thing exhibiting a trait that was not normal and consistent to the nature that they carried. So they agreed that this thing carries a different nature. This thing is a spirit. Hence the reason why it's because of its no weight, it can walk on the water, okay? Whatever that interpretation, the interpretation of that was, but they, they agreed with the fact that spirits can walk on water. So if we see something walking on water, it has to be a ghost. It has to be a spirit. And so Peter said to Jesus now, he said, Lord, first of all, on the line that Lord. So he looked at Jesus and he called him Lord. And calling him Lord here simply means he identified with his divine nature. And he identified him as the owner of him, Peter. Because Lord means owner. And owner can do with whatever, can do whatever he pleases with whatever is his property. So Peter identified himself as a property here. And as a property of the one who is Lord, the owner. And this Lord also, because Peter belonged to a spiritual nation where they, 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 they identify with God as their king, okay? And God as their Lord. And they know the spiritual nature of God. So Peter saying Lord simply means he identified that, okay, now I know the spirit that is, that is walking on the water. He identified Jesus at this moment as the one because they've been with him they've seen him do things that defy the laws of nature so already they already they've, they've wondered many times what manner of man is this what manner of man is this so they knew and they, they, they know that he was he was the reason why they're following him is because they believe that he was sent from god and that the spirit of god was in him hence why he's able to do certain things that they've never seen all the rabbis do so G. Peter called him Lord here, reminding himself that, okay, I now know who is coming. This is not a ghost. This is the Lord who has, also is a spirit. And so because of that consciousness, Peter made a request. Malibra Ados. Peter, Peter was now under an influence. He was under the influence of this Lord. Do you understand that? And that influence came by the eyes, you see. They saw this thing walking on water and their interpretation was, this is a ghost. But when that thing spoke back to them and then instantly it entered Peter that this was not a ghost like some funny spirit. I know which spirit this is. This is the same spirit of God that I have been, that I have called Lord. So Peter says, I am owned by this spirit. I identify this spirit as my owner. And for the first time today, since I have today, I have seen a different possibility to this spirit. Because until this time, they've never seen anyone walk on water and they've never seen Jesus walk on water. So they've seen Jesus do miracles, but, but not walking on water. So Peter is seeing this for the first time. And so for some reason, Peter made a request. Everybody else was silent. They were shivering in fear. But Peter said, Lord, spirit, deity, if it is you, Call unto me to come to you, doing exactly like partaking of your spirit nature. Call on me to walk on the water. Because Peter, they already identified that only a ghost can do this. So Peter asking Jesus to tell him to come and to come walking on water simply means, Jesus, tell me to act 
like a ghost. If it is you, because I identify that you are a ghost that has the ability to make someone else a ghost. You are a spirit that has the ability to suck a natural man into the space of spirituality. So Peter understood Jesus as the one who has the ability or the power to make him spiritual because this act that Jesus is performing is a spiritual act. And Jesus answered, blessed be God, Jesus never turns anyone who demands for this away. He says, yes, come. And so Peter went over the side of the boat. He stepped away from land. He steps away from the technology. He stepped away from the limitations of the human nature. Brahandos, Rikandos, Palina, Osaina, Bakosa. But because, because, because of the limitation of the human nature, they had to make for themselves a boat. So Peter crossed over the edge of the boat. He stepped out of what he was used to. He stepped out from the limitations of his canal fleshly life. And he stepped out for the first time upon the waters where there is no edge, where there is no railings, where there is no andu, there is nothing to hold. Malibra, the only thing that has the ability to hold you is what you are seeing. He stepped over. He went over the side of the boat and he walked on the water towards G praise God he walked Peter for the first time in his however old he was he exhibited his spiritual nature remember Jesus says the word that I speak to you is spirit of life at this time Jesus has spoken to them has spoken to them has revived them had jump started their spirit but they never knew the potential of all these things that has been happening to them until this moment. Peter is now walking on water. The man Peter. The physical Peter. I don't know how heavy he was. I don't know what Peter weighed. But whatever Peter weighed, he needed a boat for him to be able to launch on the water. And by profession, he was a fisherman. So he had been on boat most of his adult life. But now for the first time, he stepped out of his profession because he, his profession he, he involves boats. He stepped out of, the, of, his, of his possibility as a man. And he walked into the possibility of the God kind because he saw the God, the Lord, exhibit this character in front of him. And as he fixed his eyes on the manifestation of that possibility, he was sucked in to that reality and he walked on water towards Jesus. Then pay, pay attention to verse 30. Now this is where I'm going. But when he saw the strong wind, you see, his possibility is about to be altered now. What was possible to Peter was about to change now. Remember Peter is now living in a reality of a possibility he never knew was available to him. But now that possibility has been handed to him because of the one who he's looking at. But all of a sudden, Peter saw something different. He saw a strong wind. And remember I told you to underline strong wind when we were reading before, from verse 24. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble, away from the land, for a strong wind had risen. And they were fighting heavy waves. And pay attention to what the Bible said Jesus, uh, Peter saw here. That is about to alter his possibility now. The Bible says, and he saw, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified. Did you see that? The strong wind was not new. The waves was not new. It was there before Jesus came. Do you understand that? It had created an atmosphere that was that was an atmosphere of being gripped by fear. It, it, that, that atmosphere cripples every possibility of spirituality. Do you understand that? That atmosphere puts them in a cage of being man, a perpetually man, never being able to experience the realities of, spirit, of the spirit. But when they saw Brahinda, they saw someone walking on water, they first perceived it was a ghost. But when this person introduced himself by his words, Peter understood who he was. And still by the function of his eyes, he was able to ask a question that was outside the scope of all he has ever known. In telling Jesus to invite him into a possibility that he never until now knew was possible. And Jesus invited him. 
And Peter stepped out of the boat. He stepped out of the mundane. He stepped out of the natural. And he was now doing something that is supernatural. Yet, it was the natural Peter. But there is a personality. There is a nature that has now been activated in Peter. It's called being spiritual. And Peter was now acting like a spirit. He was walking on the water like Jesus who is full of the spirit. But all of a sudden, his eyes was removed. From what facilitated the experience that he is now standing in, his eyes was removed and his eyes was redirected again to the former things. Remember at this point now, the strong wind and the waves and the fright had now become a thing of the past for Peter now because Peter had journeyed past it now because Peter had stepped into his supernatural possibilities. At this point, Peter was like a superhero and he was walking on the water and he was not afraid. But all of a sudden, when his eyes shifted off the one who invited him into this possibility, and he looked at the thing that used to be there, that for a moment it was his eyes was taken away from, he looked back at those things, the eyes. And when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified, and immediately he was terrified. Remember? Fear is what locks you up into the possibilities of your physical nature. Immediately he saw those things, he was terrified, he was sent back into that cage. And as a man, you cannot walk on water. As a spirit, you can walk on water. And so he was thrown back into his human, manly possibilities. And the next thing that would happen is for him to act like a stone, lifeless. He began to sink. And he shouted, Say me, Lord. And verse 31 says, Jesus immediately reached out to him and grabbed him. And Jesus made two remarks that forever has changed my life now. Jesus said, You have little faith. And what does it mean to have little faith? The next statement that Jesus made, Jesus said, Why did you doubt me? So your lack of faith is your doubt of Jesus. Not the doubt of yourself. Because in your nature, you are full of impossibilities. So to doubt yourself is normal. But you see, Jesus is full of possibilities. And to doubt him is an error. Because the Bible says, in the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 26, it says, with men some things are impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are are possible and when peter saw he said lord he identified him as the one who is sovereign over all possibilities and immediately peter identified jesus as lord and asked jesus to call him into the nature that he had that defies the laws of nature peter jesus invited him and peter partook of that nature but immediately Peter took his eyes of the one who facilitated that experience and he fixed his eyes on the things that were common that locks men into a cage. Peter immediately again experienced the fate of men which is sinking. On, on Christ the solid rock I stand all other grounds are sinking sand. So for a moment Peter experienced divinity. He partook of a divine nature. He did something that was only possible. To a ghost because he learned for once in his whole lifetime to take his eyes off the things that were common to the men of the land to the men of the land the, the, the wind of the sea is strange the waves of the sea they are fearful the Bible calls it the arrogance and the pride of the sea that is the wind and the waves and to men these things constitute terror but the moment Peter took his eyes off and he saw something new, he saw new possibilities. And guess what? That possibility became his reality until he took his eyes off again. So I put it down here in my notes. The way the administration of God's divine government... Inf no, I don't want to read this. I'm going to save this till Sunday because this is just going to take us into a whole new world. But I, I, want, to, I want to close now. I want to pray for you. So the summary of what I have taught you tonight is that God wants you to live a spiritual life. He wants you to live a supernatural life. He doesn't want you to exit this natural world, but He wants you to live in it by a superpower that is furnished by the Holy Spirit. 
He doesn't want you to be an ordinary, common, mundane man. Because you see, that common, mundane man is captive to the forces and the influences that govern people in this realm. And it is the sinful nature. The idol called gold. And the father of this idol, the one behind this idol, is the devil. God wants us to be governed by his Holy Spirit. The one who lives in our human spirit, who produces fruit in our human spirit, so that by this we may partake of the divine nature of God. And that is what it means to be spiritual. And so, because of this, we constantly keep our mind occupied by the spirituality of God. By the, by the spirituality of God captured in that spirituality are the limitless possibilities of God. And as Peter did, in order to experience that dimension, your, your heart, your mind, your eyes must be fixed, focused on the one who has this as a nature. And as you look at him, you begin to be trans, you get transformed and you will experience the same realities that is available to God. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, the works that I do, they will do. And greater works he will do also. So I ask you tonight, I invite you to the consciousness of the divine nature of God. And by being conscious and by intentionally staying in the space of this consciousness, you will experience things that transcend what men are limited to. You will partake of God's spiritual and divine nature in your finances, in your walk with God, in the possibilities that abound in your ministry, in raising your kids. In, in, in having a beautiful marriage, in building a business, in discharging the duties of whatever office you find yourself in. If you're a politician, if you're a policymaker, if you're in leadership, if you're a captain of industry, whatever thing you find doing, whatever sphere of influence you find yourself, if you submit to the influence, if you choose to be governed by the Holy Spirit, He will bring you onto a journey that leads you to life. He will influence your life and by that influence, He will keep your eyes focused on the one who has limitless possibilities and as you continue to behold Him, you will, you are, you, your nature is changed and you are transformed into the nature of of God, where there is limitless possibilities, you become supernatural. That is how to be spiritual. Remember, whoever sets their mind, whoever is controlled by the sinful nature, they 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 will die. Whoever whoever is controlled by the urges or what the sinful nature urges them to do, whoever is controlled by what the sinful nature urges them to do, will die. But whoever is controlled by what the Spirit nudges them on to do, they are the ones that we live. These are the sons of God. And they are the ones that will experience the supernatural possibilities that is only available in the kingdom of God. And the way you will know what influence governs your life are the fruits that your life produce. Is your life producing drunkenness, sexual immorality, impurity, idolatry, anger, selfishness, greed, rage, wild parties, wickedness, jealousy, strife, envy? Or is your life producing joy, love, peace, self-control, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness? This is how you know what influence your life is under. And, and it, is, it becomes easy for you to change. If you by the Spirit of God put to death the deeds of the flesh, then you have crossed from death to life and you can begin to experience and live the life of God. So I pray for you in the name of Jesus. I activate in you the God consciousness in the name of Jesus. Because sometimes you give your life to Christ and you accept the Holy Spirit and the devil just makes sure that you don't stay conscious of it. That you know, it only comes in your mind every once in a while that actually uh, there is a spirit that, that should be leading me. And that is how the devil robs God's people of their inheritance. You, you cross over, you, you accept God, but you are still subject. You, you go back to live in your former ways, thereby uh, uh, being restricted to the possibilities that you've always been used to, never being able to experience new things. But I pray for you today in the name of Jesus, that as you begin to stay in the consciousness of the government of the Holy Spirit, you will be transformed from glory to glory, and you will become... 
resident and consistent in your natural, in your normal life, in your day-to-day -day life, will be sprinkled across your day-to-day -day life. Will be the supernatural. In the name of Jesus, in your finances, in your marriage, in raising your kids, in building your business, in building your career, in, in building your ministry, in walking before God, your life will be littered with supernatural occurrences that will cause men to see God through your life. In the name of Jesus. And that supernatural life will lift you above the mundane restrictions and the limitations of men. In the name of Jesus. I bring the power of the influence of the forces of this age that constrains and imprisons men to immorality. That imprisons people to, to impurity. That causes people to perpetually be bowed down to idols of gold and silver. I remove your portion from that, from that, from that economy. I remove your life from that congregation and I bring you into new possibilities even as Jesus invited Peter into a new possibility I invite you today by the power of the Holy Spirit into a new possibility where you begin to walk on water in the name of Jesus in your finances you will walk on water in raising your kids you will walk on in living as a young person in this generation it looks bonkers to live as a young person in this generation and be pure and be holy and still be successful and still love God and be on fire for God it looks impossible it looks like walking on water but listen to me by the words that I speak today by the power that sponsors these words you will your, your possibility has now been altered positively you will walk on water if you can say amen in the name of Jesus I am super excited to have brought this word your way again today. Apostle Victor Island is my name. This is Life Spring Assembly. And I perceive that I will continue this on Sunday. Okay? So, uh, the title for Sunday will be Dominion. Remember I said, God called us to partake of his nature so that we can have dominion. Okay? So, I will conclude um, what I have started tonight on Sunday. I will, I will finish that part portion of my note that I couldn't read today. I will read it to you. And then that will take us into... Um, the contemplation of Sunday which is dominion and I believe that from tonight starting from tonight and concluding on Sunday or attempting to conclude on Sunday your life will begin to experience new possibilities even in the name of Jesus um, I love you so much I'll see you on Sunday enjoy the rest of your weekend and keep keeping the kingdom God loves you and God bless you I'll see you on Sunday